So let's start off with a really basic question. Why is it important that some flowers control when they bloom? Or some plants control when they flower? So some flowers bloom only early in the spring. Some bloom only late in the fall. Why? Why does that make any sense, Stella? Pollinators would certainly be an important one. So if plants are insect pollinated, it doesn't do the plant a whole lot of good to flower at a time that the pollinators aren't available. Okay, that's one. What's another one? Yeah, so that's, that's something we tend to forget about, that flowering is the beginning point of the, produ the reproductive phase that's going to produce seeds. And that takes a finite amount of time, right? So... You don't want to plant a flower where it flowers so late that winter comes and the seed can't or the fruit can't develop. But it's also important in terms of seed dispersal, right? When those seeds or fruits are ready, perhaps has to be timed in terms of seasons or has to be timed in terms of the organisms that play a role in dispersing the seeds. What else? A couple more important ones. The avoidance of uh, like frost damage and things the flowers are sensitive? Uh, yeah, so avoiding, avoiding seasonal difficulties, too hot, too cold, too dry, too wet, those sorts of things. Yep, absolutely. One more important one. Are all plants self-pollinators? If, they if they're obligate cross-pollinators, doesn't the timing when flowers are produced isn't that important? They can't just flower randomly. They want they need to be synchronized. So they can the pollen on one flower could be ready at the time that the the, the female reproductive parts are ready on another flower. Okay, so there's lots of reasons for flowering to be coordinated. So the questions that we really want to ask ourselves are what are the external and internal signals that are involved? and coordinating the timing of flowering. Right? And we'll see that they're both external and internal signals. And how are these signals perceived and how are they trans uh, transduced? So one important place to start is to recognize that the transition from vegetative to reproductive growth happens at the shoot apical meristem. So for vegetative growth, The vegetative meristem, in, in uh, the most general sense, is indeterminate. That is, under the right conditions, that shoot apical meristem can continue to grow basically forever. But once the plant, once the meristem makes the transition from the vegetative to the reproductive stage, that meristem becomes determinant. It produces one flower or one set of flowers and it's done. That meristem no longer exists after that. Okay, so this represents a very fundamental transition in terms of the growth habit of the plant. And obviously, what's going on in the transition from the vegetative to the reproductive meristem is going to be what we're going to be focusing on today. Okay, the fact that it happens at the meristem tells us that everything that happens after this transition in the plant will be determined by the characteristics of this new meristem. And we've seen some examples of this already. So here is a Rhabdopsis in its non-flowering vegetative growth, it's a rosette. But once it flowers, it bolts, it produces these long stems, the shape of the leaves change, and the flowers are produced. So everything that happens after flowering begins, after the plant perceives the signal and starts to change the meristem, represents new growth from a different meristem, a meristem that is programmed to do something different. 
And recognizing that will really facilitate understanding what's going on in this, in this um, discussion of flowering. Okay, so one of the things that we need to think about when we think about control of flowering is that there are really, we can divide plant growth into three different phases. There's a juvenile phase. In the juvenile phase, the plant cannot flower even if all the conditions are right. Following the juvenile phase, there's an adult vegetative phase. And in this adult vegetative state, it's capable of flowering. But only if the conditions are right. That is, there are certain environmental cues, certain internal cues that the plant needs to receive before it can flower. Then obviously there's the reproductive phase. This produces the flowers. So we need to think about the what's going on in the transitions between these different phases. There are some plants that as soon as they leave the juvenile phase, they flower automatically. They require no external signals to flower. They only use internal signals. And these are called autonomous plants. or autonomous regulation. And this is almost always related to plant size and or age. So you're familiar with this in, for example, many trees will not flower until they reach a certain size or a certain age. There are obviously other types of plants where the transition from juvenile to adult occurs by the same characteristics, age and size. But then the transition to flowering requires some external signal. And these external signals are often, often either day length or temperature, or both. And if you think about it, day length and temperature should together be able to provide all the information a plant needs to know, for example, how does it tell the difference between flowering in the early spring or in the late fall? The day lengths are the same. But the preceding temperatures in those two seasons will be very different. So together, these two environmental parameters ought to be able to give plants the ability to distinguish all the different seasons, all the different timings that it might flower. So as I said, the phase changes, or the changes that that happen in the plant associated with the uh, transition to the reproductive phase are happening at the shoot apical merosem. And what that means is that if we look at sort of this diagrammatic picture of uh, a plant where the dark green represents tissues that are produced in the juvenile phase, the lighter green represents tissues that are produced in the adult vegetative stage, and the yellowish ones are the the tissues that are produced in the reproductive stage and these little balls at the end here are the flowers, that on any branch, any shoot of the plant, we should see at the base of that shoot the oldest tissues. And that when the plant goes through the juvenile to adult vegetative 
or the adult vegetative to the reproductive transition, each of the existing branches will show the characteristics of that transition. One of the things that we're going to see is when a plant goes through this transition, it's not just one shoot. The whole plant goes through this transition simultaneously. So we would expect to see a coordinated shift in the characteristics of all the meristems on the plant. All the actively growing branches will show these characteristics. Here's a picture that shows English ivy, which is one of the plants that has pretty obvious changes. So the juvenile leaves are these broad lobed leaves, while the reproductive plant produces these ovate leaves. So there's a very obvious change in the shapes of the leaves that are produced from the meristems once that meristem has gone through the transition from juvenile to adult or adult to uh, reproduction. We see the same thing in Arabidopsis. The adult leaves are these rosette leaves that are kind of uh, oval shaped and the leaves that are produced on the, from reproductive meristems, they're called colleen leaves, they're much longer and thinner. Okay, so what these represent are changes in the programming of the meristem, right? Remember, the meristem is what's producing those leaves and shoots and eventually the flowers. And the programming that is going on to produce this rosette plant with these broad oval-shaped leaves versus these long um, shoots with very different shaped leaves is a result of the transition from vegetative to reproductive growth in the meristem. Okay, so the model that your textbook gives you for what's going on here is very confusing. Um, so I've modified the model. So this is taken from figure, uh, what is it, 25.12 in the textbook, but it's not the same. It's different. And this is the one you should pay attention to, to because the, the one in the book doesn't give you the whole story. So if we start off with a juvenile plant, it's incompetent to flower. That is, if you give it all the right signals that would cause an adult plant to flower, the juvenile plant cannot respond. Why not? What is it that prevents that juvenile plant, or what is it that could prevent that juvenile plant from flowering when you give it the right conditions? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's basically it. Either there's something there that's blocking the signal once it's perceived, or there's no ability to perceive the signal. Okay? And in general, it is a combination of both of those that contribute to juvenility in plants. There's a hormonal component to it, and there's also a signal perception and signal transduction um, limitation as well. Right? So juvenile plants, you give them the right conditions, they, don't, they just remain juvenile. Okay, once they make the transition to adult vegetative plants, these plants are now competent to flower. That is, all the things that are needed to flower are there except for the right signals. It has to receive those signals. So everything is in place now, right? So in the context of what we've been talking about all along, the competency to respond, the presence of the signal transduction pathway is all ready to go. It's just waiting for the signal. So when that signal arrives, when it gets, the plant is induced, it goes from a state of being competent to a state of being determined. What we mean by determined is that the signal transduction pathway that is initiating that transition of the shoot apical, apical meristem from vegetative to reproductive growth has occurred. You may not see it for days, weeks, or even months sometime. That is, a plant can be induced, but not necessarily show any flowers or any adult reproductive leaves, right? But it has gone through the transition. That means if you change the growth conditions, a determined plant will still flower, right? 
So what we need to, the, what's happened during this induction phase is basically perception of the signal and triggering that change in the shoot apical meristem. Whether that change has been manifested in terms of what we see in the plant doesn't matter. <coughs> the plant, you just leave the plant in those conditions, it will, it will still flower. Yes? How is this irreversible it is irreversible. That is, a determined plant will flower independent of the conditions you put in. That's not entirely true. There are some conditions that you can, you can reverse it with, but they are typically non-physiological conditions. So in the laboratory, you can, you can reverse it. But under normal conditions, it isn't reversed. Okay? And then we, if we wait long enough, we'll see that there's some hormonal signal that is triggering from this determined to actually seeing the formation of the flowers. And as I said, the formation of the flowers could take as long as several weeks or more before you actually see them. So we want to tease apart what's going on, particularly in these stages here, from where it's competent to where the plant becomes induced. It's seen the signal to where the flowers are actually produced. Okay, so I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about a developmental aspect of this. That is, in this transition from vegetative to reproductive growth, what is it that determines how a flower forms? How it goes from producing leaves to producing flowers? And this is really something that we should put in the, in the chapter on um, developmental regulation. It's an excellent example of something that is referred to as pattern formation. We talked about pattern formation, for example, in the distribution of leaves along the axis of a stem. The term we use for that is phyllotaxy. Right? Are the leaves opposite each other, or do they kind of go around the stem in a, in a spiral or something like that? That's determined developmentally at the shoot apical meristem. What's happening when you produce flowers is also controlled at the shoot apical meristem, but obviously it's gone through the transition from vegetative to reproductive growth. So this is a simple model that actually was worked out in Arabidopsis and is probably one of the most famous models for understanding pattern formation in an organism. So if we look at a cross-section of a flower, there are really four different types of organs in the flower. As you go from the outside towards the inside, those organs are the sepals. Those are typically um, chlorophyll-containing leaf-like structures. The petals, the petals are often have colors in them that are involved in attracting pollinators. The stamens, the male reproductive organs, and the carpal containing the female reproductive organs. So these are organized in four whorls, four concentric circles. So as we go from the outside to the inside, we can model this as being four different regions in which different floral organs are produced. So one of the key things in thinking about this transition from vegetative to reproductive growth is how this is controlled in a developmental sense, in a gene expression sense. And we really need to consider two types of proteins that regulate this. There is the meristem identity genes These encode transcription factors. And in the case of flowering, the meristem identity gene that we're going to be concerned with is the gene that triggers, that produces a transcription factor that triggers the vegetative meristem to be converted into a reproductive meristem. That is, one transition factor 
transcription factor that is controlling many other genes that turns off genes associated with vegetative growth and turns on genes associated with reproductive growth. Genes that are going to lead to the formation of these concentric rings of organs. Okay? So at the next level down, below this sort of large-scale regulation, we need to think about floral organ identity genes. These are genes that have more local control. These are also transcription factors. Developmentally, we often refer to these things like floral organ or identity genes as homeotic genes. They control the development of individual organs. Okay, so that. We have two different categories here. Transcription factors that say convert the meristem from vegetative to reproductive growth. Those transcription factors control these transcription factors that in turn determine where you get sepals and petals and stamens and carpels. Okay? All right. The model for this is pretty straightforward. There's three genes that are involved in controlling this. The genes are, we'll just call them A, B, and C. If gene, this, if, uh, gene A is expressed by itself, we end up with sepals. If gene C is expressed by itself, we end up with carpels. A plus B gives us petals, and B plus C gives us stamens. So how is the pattern formation controlled in the context of these three genes? Remember, these are transcription factors. What is it about these three genes that gives us this pattern of the flowers? You're, it's, it, it's an easy question. Don't, don't make it hard. Yeah, where they're expressed, right? What, one of the things that students see this model and they get totally wound up in is that A must be expressed in this particular region. B must be expressed in this particular region. Or sorry, C and B must be expressed in this particular region in order to get a flower as we know it, right? Is that any different than any other transcription factors or signal transduction pathways that we've talked about all semester? No, of course not. Some cells produce things that respond to auxin in one way, and other cells produce some, some other way of responding, or may not respond at all, right? So the only thing that's important to think about in the context of the, the floral organ development is what is it that controls where these genes are expressed? Right? And that's no different than anything else that we've talked about. There are some important components of this. There's one particularly important component, and that is that A and C are mutual repressors. That is, if you mutate A, then C will be expressed throughout the flower. If you mutate C, then A will be expressed throughout the flower. That is something that was deduced from the model and then tested experimentally and found to be true. So one of the things that you should be able to do is go through and say, what happens if we have a mutation in gene A? What would we expect the genotype and the phenotype of the plant to be? 
So the book goes through this. So here's a mutation in C. If C is absent, then the repression of A in the region where C is normally present is lost. And so we have A being expressed throughout the flowers. B is expressed in its normal place. Wherever A is by itself, if we look up at the wild type, wherever A is expressed by itself, we get sepals. So we get sepals on the outside world, and we get sepals on the inside world. Wherever A and B are expressed, we get petals in the wild type. So we would expect the organization of this mutant flower to be sepal, petal, petal, sepal. Okay? Relatively straightforward in terms of thinking about three transcription factors that are identifying these four floral organs. If we do the same thing with a mutation in A or a mutation in B, we should be able to predict, based on understanding how the wild type expression works, we should be able to predict what the what the morphology of the flowers would be in, in all of these. This is pretty straightforward. You should make sure that you can explain these different morphologies based on the, the, the expression patterns of these genes in the wild type and the mutants. But it's something that you, can, you don't have to memorize. You can look it up in the book. Um, the book says something about uh, some flowers like having like a flower in the flower in the flower. Flower within a flower within a flower? Yeah, like, is that what happens? Like, how is that different from that? Like, when, when do we get that? That's a good question. So, how would we get, if we think of a flower morphologically, of having one flower expressed within a flower, what must happen there? How could that happen? I'm not looking for gory details. Just very generally, what must happen? Would that just be the mutation or would it be sepal petal, sepal petal? Like um, that would be, but that would give you a concentric. So you're saying like an entire flower? Yeah, an entire, entire flower with a flower. Would it be a mutation in the meristem identity gene? Uh, no, because if it, if it was a mutation in the meristem identity gene, what would you end up with? Oh, leaves. You just end up with a vegetative plant, right? Right? So it's got to be a mutation in these genes, but what about these genes? That's the thing I'm looking for. If we see a flower within a flower sort of thing, what must be going on? They have to be overexpressed? Uh, not necessarily overexpressed. Do you have double expression? Yeah. So in other words, maybe a, a different way of saying it is the pattern of expression has changed. So you have this normal wild type pattern, but then somewhere in here, you have this pattern repeated internal to this, right? Yeah. So the, the short answer is there must be a change in the region where these genes are expressed. Right? If you're going to get a different pattern, a flower within a flower, or any of these other mutants, it has to be a change in where these, where these genes are expressed because these genes are the genes that control floral organ development, where they have, where the organs develop and where they don't. So the meristem identity gene thing would only work if you have like a split meristem or something like that. A meristem identity gene? There are two meristems in the circle, like it just wouldn't work. Um, so if there's a meristem identity gene whose product signals make a, vet, a rep reproductive meristem. If there's a mutation in that gene, what would be the outcome? Mm -hmm. No, it would be nothing. Mm -hmm. The plant could not flower. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be, the, that would be the, the characteristic of it. Wouldn't you need like more world to uh, create a flower than a flower? Like how do you yeah, so you have to have a, a set of worlds expressed within the set of worlds, right? So you have to have this pattern expressed somewhere inside here again. So you end up with a world, worlds within worlds. How many worlds would 
I don't know. That's a good question. So, I mean, some of you, some of you have studied horticulture, right? So, if you think about it, plants with additional sets of petals or additional sepals that behave like petals and things like that, those are often um, horticulturally interesting plants, right? So, mutations that alter these characteristics, very often we're, we don't really care if the, if the flower is functional in terms of producing seeds. We're more interested, is the flower functional in, in terms of producing something that looks good, right? So a lot of these really bizarre double flowers and stuff like that represent mutations, whether they're induced or whether they're naturally occurring in these floral organ identity genes. Okay? Yeah. So does the pre-existing structure of the meristem play an important role in where these things, or in the cells that are able to respond to these signals and turn on the different, you know, A, B, and C? Yeah, so let's maybe think about it from the context of what cells are going to respond to this signal. If we're talking about uh, conversion of a vegetative meristem into a floral meristem. What cells in the meristem are going to respond to this signal? All of them or just a few? Probably all of them, right? Certainly the vast majority of them. But the ones that respond to these signals are going to be more localized, right? So there's, we're not talking about anything different than what we talked about before. That the, the, formation, the trans, formation of these transcription factors must turn on a sequence of events that gives the distribution of these transcription factors a very cell-dependent distribution. Otherwise, we wouldn't get those worlds. Right? So that means there has to be um, different signal transduction pathways already established in that meristem as the result of these four um, meristem identity genes. It's nowhere as near as simple as this model makes it look like because it's a chicken and the egg problem. What determines where these transcription factors are made? Or where the pathways that respond to those transcription factors exist? Right? It's got to keep going back to the point where this whole thing started with the formation of the meristem identity genes. But again, in the most general sense, it's no different than any of the other signaling pathways that we've talked about. They're cell-specific expression of signaling pathways throughout the plant, throughout development. This is just one more specific example. Okay. All right, so let's turn to thinking about photoperiodism because day length dependent dependence of flowering is something we've known about since I believe it was somewhere in the 1700s where there's the first evidence that people figured this out. And if we, we look at characteristics of plants that require specific day lengths to flower, we can define two broad categories of plants. We can define, so we're, we're, we're plotting on the y-axis here, the percent of the plants that flower. We can define long day plants, that is plants that flower when the day length is longer than some minimum critical day length. Or we can define short day plants, plants that flower when the day length is less than some critical day length. So phenomenologically, for describing plants that, that require specific day lengths to flower, this works pretty well. So those flowers that require day length dependent external signals either fall into categories of requiring days that are shorter than some critical length or days that are longer than some critical length. And as we'll see, what's happening 
in terms of the signaling that goes to the meristem to say go from vegetative to reproductive is similar but not identical in these two characteristics. Okay, there are also some plants that require no day length, no specific day length, day neutral plants. Very often those plants require specific temperatures to flower. Um, there are also a few weird plants that require a very narrow range of days. If it's too long or too short, it won't flower. But if it's just right, it will flower. But short and long day plants are the, are the common, most common characteristic. One of the things that's important to keep in mind, something to think about, this would be a good question for an exam. Here's a figure from the textbook that's showing how day length varies at any given latitude as a function of the time of year. So what this tells you is that a plant that requires a day length of longer than 14 hours will flower at different times of year at different latitudes. So if you have a plant that has a broad geographic distribution, north and south, the plants that grow in Minneapolis flower at the same time of year as plants that grow in Florida. So is it the day length characteristic that's locked into the plant? Or do we have different ecotypes? The plants in Minneapolis flower at a different time of year or different, the same time of year but different day length than the plants in Florida. Are you talking about the same kind of plant? Yeah, I'm talking about the same species of plant. Right? So you can imagine a daisy you know, that that's blooms in Florida and blooms in Minneapolis. I'm not looking for the answer. I don't want you to give me the answer. There isn't one specific answer. There are many different answers depending on the plants. But you should be able to think of, in the context of all the things we're going to talk about in today's lecture, how you could imagine a scenario where the plants in Florida and Minneapolis flower at the same time of year, or the plants in Florida and Minneapolis, same plant, flowers at different times of year. Either one of those is possible. And you should be able to explain how that might happen. Okay, so one of the things that the textbook tells you is that, in fact, it is not the length of the day that determines when the plant flowers. It's the length of the night. There used to be some, a good explanation of this in the text, and for some reason they've taken it out. One of the things I'd like you to think about is what's an experiment that you could do to test is it the length of the day that determines when the plant flowers, or is it the length of the night? What sorts of things could you do to distinguish those two? We'll come back to this in just a second. Okay, so the traditional picture, if we look at short day plants, so here's our 24-hour day length, and here's the critical day length. If the days are longer than this critical day length, obviously the gray is night and the yellow is day, if the days are longer than this critical day length, the plant does not flower. If the days are shorter than this critical day length, the plants will flower. And interestingly, if you interrupt the night, the long night, with a short bit of light. Interrupting that night prevents the plant from flowering. Uh, when they say flash of light, like there were several examples, like how long or how short? Okay, flash? so it, it's actually, we'll see, or we won't, I wasn't going to talk about it, but I'm, since you asked, I will. For short day plants, the length of the illumination that's required to reverse the long night is quite short. It doesn't need much light. A few seconds is sufficient. If we do the opposite experiment with long day plants, 
if the day is longer than the critical day length, the plant flowers. If the day is shorter than the critical day length, it doesn't flower. If you interrupt the long night with light, the plant will flower. But the timing of this, this requires like an hour of light. Okay, so there is a difference in the effect of how, mu how much light is required to break the long night in short day plants versus long day plants. The effect is the same. That is, in short day plants, the long night, interrupting the long night, causes the plant to flower. Sorry, causes, prevents the plant from flowering. And in the long day plants, interrupting the long night causes the plant to flower. Stella? Okay, so let's let's stay back for just a second because part of the question that I just asked you, how do you do an experiment to determine whether it's day length or night length? We've I've given you the answer in this picture. Because if we look at the short day plants, here we have the conditions where the plant should flower. The day length is shorter than the critical day length, right? But if we interrupt the night, the plant doesn't flower. So that would be a suggestion that it's not the length of the day, but rather the length of the night. The same is true in the long day plants. Here we have a, a day length that is, would typically be too short to flower. But if we interrupt the night with light, then the plant flowers. So both of these suggest that what the plant is sensing is actually the length of the night rather than the length of the day. So that gives you part of the story. But the other part of the story is more complicated to do. Prove that it's not day length. This suggests that it's night length. Tell me an experiment that you could do to determine whether it's, to show that it's not day length. And there's a lot of different ways of doing this, right? I mean, no, I'm not gonna, I don't want you to do it right now, but it's something that you should, for example, be able to come up with for an, an, to answer on an exam question. Okay, so one of the things right away that you should be asking yourself is we know that light that comes in the middle of the night is having an effect. What's perceiving that light? What's the light receptor? So we've talked about two main types of light receptors, phytochromes and uh, blue light receptors. How, would we, how can we easily distinguish between those two? What would be the easiest way to figure out whether it's phytochrome or blue light? Color of the light, yes, yeah, so you could do action spectra. Yep, even easier way. Uh, yeah, okay, that would be another one. Even easier yet. Uh, yeah, that would be sort of an action spectrum sort of thing. But what I'm trying to get at is, remember that phytochrome has red, far red reversibility. Right? right? So you should be able to, for long day plants or short day plants, if you interrupt the night, it will cause the long day plant to flower and keep the short day plant from flowering. If you give red followed by far red, if phytochrome is the receptor, then it should reverse that effect. And that's exactly what happens. Okay, so simple experiments like this tell us that phytochrome is playing an essential role in doing something related to perceiving day length or night length. What that something is, is presented in the text. But one of the things I challenge you to think about is the context of what's presented in the text consistent with what we've just been talking about. The context, the, the text, the model in the text is called the coincidence model. And the coincidence model has actually been around for a long time. 
the specific players in the Quinson's model should tell us that phytochrome is probably one of the players in the model. The Quinson's model, I'm just going to show it for Arabidopsis. Arabidopsis is a long day plant. It wants long days to be able to flower. So the question is, how does a plant detect day length or night length? A big part of this has to do with circadian rhythms. Or basically what's often referred to as the internal clock. If we have time at the uh, end of the lecture, I think we will, I'll come back to talk a little bit more about um, the circadian rhythms and the internal clock. But let's just for now assume that there's some mechanism in the plant for the plant to be able to keep track of time. So it knows how long it's been since daybreak. Okay, So it sort of keeps track of things between starting the transition from night to day or maybe it's the other way around, day to night. But the plant can keep track of that and know where it is, how long it's been since sunrise or how long it's been since sunset. Okay? So the key thing to understanding this coincidence model is to understand, first of all, that the presence of this RNA, it's the constant gene, This gene has been known to be involved in regulation of flowering for quite a while. And what it turn, turns out is the mRNA for this gene is controlled by the circadian clock. That is, it rises and falls. The amount of the CO, messenger RNA, rises and falls in a regular pattern every day. So. It's high during the, at some time after sunrise. So maybe 12 to 20 hours after sunrise. The messenger RNA associated with this CO gene is high. And what the coincidence model says is there has to be something else that's present during the time this messenger RNA is high in order for flowering to be triggered. And the supposition is that what has to be high is the PFR form of phytochrome. Right? So PFR should be high throughout the day and then go down at night. But the fact that the messenger RNA and phytochrome are high are what's required to make the CO protein. The CO protein is the thing that triggers flowering. So only when the messenger RNA is high during the light, when phytochrome is also in the PFR form, can the messenger RNA be translated into the protein. The coincidence of the messenger RNA and the light is what's required to induce flowering. So the key thing to remember here is that when this messenger RNA accumulates is dependent only upon the amount of time that's passed since sunrise. It's controlled by the circadian clock. Phytochrome is only controlled by the light. So phytochrome, they should put a graph on here that shows phytochrome being high during the day and low during the night, right? And it's only when both phytochrome and the CO messenger RNA are both present that that messenger RNA is translated and the CO protein is produced and the presence of that CO protein triggers flowering. This was actually discovered right upstairs on the second floor. The role of constants in flowering was discovered by a postdoc who was studying something completely different. He was studying translocation of materials in the phloem. But he happened to be using this gene as a, um, like a re, uh, reporter gene. 
and it turned out that the things he was doing manipulated the flowering of the plant. Okay, so the key to understanding this model is recognizing that there has to be a coincidence, a simultaneous presence of the messenger RNA that's controlled by the circadian clock and of phytochrome or some light detector that when those are both present in the light in long enough days, then the plant will flower. If the phytochrome goes away, if night starts before this messenger RNA starts to rise, because the days are short, the plant won't flower. Stella? So are there plants that flower um, just at night? Are there plants that flower at night? Yeah. That flowers open up at night? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so is that related to this? Uh, oh, no, because they're already flowering. The flower, exactly. So this is, remember, what we're talking about here is the signal that's inducing the transition from vegetative to reproductive growth. What you're talking about is a different signal that causes the flower to open or close, right? Yeah, so there are flowers that open only at night, primarily because their pollinators are nocturnal, right? Okay. So does this model make sense? And the only thing that we have to change for a short day plan is have whatever this protein is, and the book describes the, the model for rice, it's a different protein but the protein that is produced by the coincidence of the messenger RNA and the phytochrome, rather than promoting flowering, it inhibits flowering. That's the only thing that's different for the coincidence model for short day plants. Right? So the coincidence of the messenger RNA and phytochrome produces a protein which then signals flowering for, lo for long day plants. For short day plants, the coincidence produces a protein that inhibits flower. Okay, so now, well, I don't want you to do this now, but I want you to think about it. Um, I won't guarantee you, but something about this is going to be on the exam. That is, can we fit this sort of model for flowering? phytochrome dependent regulation of or detection of night length into this model, the coincidence model, of how the overlap between something that's controlled by the circadian clock, the messenger RNA, and something detects light, phytochrome, how the overlap of those two things can either trigger or shut off flowering. Are those consistent or not? That's what I want you to think about. Okay. One important thing that we should be considering in this, we know that what happens on the transition from vegetative growth to reproductive growth is a change that happens in the meristem. Where are these environmental signals? Where is the light being sensed? And the answer is, it's not in the meristem. It's in the leaves. Right? A simple way to demonstrate that is with a grafting experiment. So here are two plants where the shoots are not induced. Okay? They have not seen the right day length to flower. And the experiment is to take a leaf that has been induced and graft it onto the plant. And what you see is all those axillary buds get converted into floral meristems. If you take a non-induced leaf and graft it on there, nothing happens. This is kind of a weird experiment. Um, you might say, well, what happened to all the other leaves on the plant? They took all the other leaves off the plant so that signals that are being produced by this leaf are not diluted by all the other leaves. Okay. So it's really sort of forcing the issue, but it's pretty clear. The induced leaf causes the non-induced shoot to flower. The non-induced leaf has no effect. Okay, So there is some signal that's being produced in the induced leaf 
that is being translocated through the plant to the meristems to tell them to flower. This is the idea behind the, the idea of a um, flowering hormone. Did I spell that right? No, it's backwards. Florigen. The idea of florigen has been around for 70 or 80 years. Shouldn't be surprising. Good support for it right here. A signal that is, that is translocated from an induced leaf to non-induced stems. This actually even works, this experiment's even more cool. You take an induced petunia plant and graft it onto, I can't remember what kind of plant this is, I think it was henbane or something like that, a different species. Henbane is not day length dependent. Henbane requires cold days to flower, right? So you take a non-induced henbane plant and put on a plant that flowers based on day length and the cold dependent plant flowers, okay? So it suggests that there is a common signal that is involved in regulation of, of flowering, common at least among these two fairly divergent species. So what is that signal? This model tells us it's got something to do with the CO protein, the constant protein. But the constant protein is not translocated out of the leaves. The constant protein is in interestingly expressed primarily in the phloem of the leaves, in the companion cells. But it is not translocated in the phloem. So that should give us some important picture. If the constant protein is produced in the companion cells but not translocated in the phloem, then the constant protein is probably a signal for the cells to produce whatever the, the, the florigen is. Okay? So the big hunt was to find the compound, whether it's a protein or whatever, that's translocated in the phloem from the induced leaves to the shoot apical meristem to induce flowering. And the book gives you this figure. Pay attention to my suggestion. This figure is almost useless <laughs> in trying to figure out what's going on. It's got so much information in it that, that it's crazy. The key thing is that the actual signal that moves from the leaves to the meristem is a protein. And it is the product, keep losing my chalk here, it is the product of what's referred to as flowering locus um, T. Abbreviated FT. For a long time, it was thought that it's not the FT protein, but it was the FT mRNA that's produced in the companion cells and translocated in the phloem. But it turns out that's wrong. It's not the mRNA, it's the protein itself. So what happens is the production of constants protein in the phloem triggers in the companion cells the transcription and translation of flowering locus T. The FT protein is what's translocated in the phloem. It's not, as this suggests, the mRNA. It's the protein that's translocated in the phloem that triggers the transition of the shoot apical meristem from vegetative to reproductive growth. So whether this is true in all plants, it's not clear. But the 30 or 40 plants that have been looked at quite specifically, it is the same flowering locus. So it does suggest that there is a common florigen, and that florigen is the FT protein. Okay, so we have...
pretty much all the pictures of what's going on in the signal transduction pathway of light dependent flowering pretty much in place. The other environmental factor that's involved in controlling flowering is temperature. And typically it's low temperature if there's a requirement for a specific temperature, low temperature. And treating plants with cold temperatures to induce flowering is a process called vernalization. So just like some seeds require low temperature in order to be able to germinate, some plants require low temperature in order to flower. Okay, so we've basically covered the, the light de dependent phenomenon. We got a general idea of the signal transduction pathway. I want to finish up by talking about circadian rhythms. This is a really interesting area of biology. Um, first of all, what do we mean by a circadian rhythm? Who's good at Greek or Latin? <laughs> right? Circa means about a day. Right? So these are rhythms that have um, times of about 24 hours. Typically, the actual times range from somewhere to, from 18 to probably 35 hours. How do we define, how do we evaluate whether or not something is under circadian control? It's relatively simple. I think this is the next figure. Yeah. So if we look at this figure down here. Here we have um, plants, an organism growing under um, the normal uh, light-dark cycle. So in this case, it's 12 hours of dark and 12 hours of light. What we're plotting here could be any number of different things. Tell me something that you know that peaks in the day and goes down at night. We've talked about a bunch of things. Don't say photosynthesis. Well, you could say photosynthesis, but you'd have to measure it under very specific sorts of conditions. There is a rhythm in photosynthesis, but you can't measure You'd have to put light on it at night to be able to measure it, right? What's something else that we talked about? Um... So is there a rhythm within the plant that the phytochrome is made or not made? Um, I don't think there's anything directly related to the phytochrome. Well, One thing, yeah. I don't have a CO2 level. Because um, aren't still made clothes tonight, for the most part. Yeah, OK. So one of the things, I've got to go a little bit further into this to define what I mean by a circadian rhythm. because. We see, for example, we could say photosynthesis, right? Or we could take, say, CO2. But what would happen so that if it we're talking about photosynthesis or CO2 when we put it in continuous darkness? Would the CO2 levels go up and down in the plant in continuous darkness? Okay, so a circadian rhythm continues in continuous darkness with a period of about 24 hours. So one of the things that we talked about that fits into this category is nitrate reductase activity. So nitrate reductase is very highly controlled by the circadian clock. It's high during the day. And remember we said that the lifetime of the nitrate reductase protein is very short on the order of three hours. So at night, nitrate reductase activity crashes really quickly. And if you continue if you continue to monitor nitrate reductase activity into the night, into continuous night, that up and down activity of nitrate reductase continues even when there's no light. But the period is no longer exactly 24 hours. 
It could be shorter or longer than 24 hours. So it depends on a lot of different things, but basically it is some indicator of the period of the internal clock that's controlling this. This tells us that there's some internal clock that is keeping track of time so it knows when to make nitrate reductase and when not to. Yeah, I'm not, I'm just, that's that's circadian. That's two different words. Circadian. Oh. Okay. That's the root of the word right. circadian. And then what are, like? I, you're what right. I can't spell very well. Anymore, but. <laughs> well, we talked about before the CO proteins. Yeah. That's also like following. Yeah. So, right. Here's something that's under circadian control. Control. The messenger RNA associated with the CO protein. Right. It's peaks like 15 hours after sunrise. It starts to rise something like 12 hours after sunrise or something like that. It's under circadian control, right? So things like this are indicators that physiological processes are controlled by a circadian clock. If you put it in continuous darkness and the rhythm goes away, that's not a circadian process. What is it that makes the process, the rhythm, be exactly 24 hours in a daylight, day night cycle, but different period in continuous darkness? It's just in the book something about how the change of Yeah, phase shifts are related to this, but it's, the phase shifts are a lot more complicated. This, this is actually relatively straightforward. What does this tell us? If we made these days 22 hours long, 11 hours of light and 11 hours of darkness, would the rhythm have a phase of 22 hours or would it be 24 hours? It would be 22 hours. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the day-night rhythm is in training the clock. In other words, the clock is being linked somehow to the normal light-dark cycle. So there's something associated with the transition from dark to light or light to dark that triggers, that resets the clock so that the period is exactly 24 hours because the normal light dark period is exactly 24 hours. Obviously you can go in the lab and change this around. So under normal circumstances this circadian clock is entrained, is linked into the period of normal light dark cycles. You take away that entrainment, you take away that stimulus and the clock continues but now it can use, continues at its endogenous rhythm, the rhythm that's built into the clock. And those rhythms vary. They can be as short as 18 hours or as long as 35 hours. So who has circadian rhythms? Do you guys have circadian rhythms? Absolutely. Plants have circadian rhythms? Yeah. How about prokaryotes? Prokaryotes have circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms evolved a long time ago. The earliest organisms probably had some sort of circadian rhythms. Why? Why does it make sense that organisms would have something that controls when processes happen in the cell? Why is nitrate reductase low at night and high in the day? Well, I don't have the answer to this question, but uh, <laughs> yesterday when I was, I read on Wikipedia the article about circadianism, yeah. and it said that maybe it was because it would be good for these like ancient cells to do DNA uh, replication like in the darkness to prevent damage from, from UV light. So can we make that more general? 
Anybody? So to adapt to changing environments. Let's be more specific of what changing environments you're adapting to. Yeah, light and dark. Basically, yes, yeah. light and dark. So if replicating DNA in the light can be dangerous, then make DNA replication happen at night. And the way you can do that is by making sure that the enzymes involved with DNA replication are not made during the day or they're shut off somehow during the day. Here's an interesting one. If you, Rubisco, remember Rubisco? Right? So Rubisco shows a circadian rhythm. It goes up in the day and down at night. And the rise in Rubisco precedes dawn by several hours. In other words, the Rubisco starts to get made just before the light comes on. Right? It's sort of as if the plant was preparing for the light coming on. So in general, what's going on here is allocation of resources do things in the plant when it's most beneficial, or prevent things from happening in the plant when it might be detrimental. So these circadian clocks control a lot of different processes. And the way you identify the circadian process is by looking to see where that rhythm continues when you put the, put the organism in continuous darkness. There's hundreds of different circadian processes. So a lot of you ask questions about what's the circadian clock, right? How, what's controlling all of this, right? We, we understand pretty well at the molecular level a, a number of the different types of circadian clocks. And basically, it's two interacting pathways, one that affects the output of the other. Right? So if you have one pathway that inhibits the output of the other, and there's sort of a delay in there, you could have one thing going up and the other thing going down, and as the thing goes down, it stops the inhibition of the other, so it goes, yeah, so it's, it's sort of, um, who's, who's good at calculus? Any got any calculus fiends in here? Okay, so you know what a first order, first order equation is? First order differential equation? Yeah, so, um, but first order differential equations are what de is the same thing as that determines the rate of an enzyme process. If you couple two first order differential equations together, they oscillate. If you couple them together so there's a common variable, they always oscillate. If you couple two enzyme reactions together with common intermediates, they oscillate. It's a fundamental mathematical principle that biology figured out how to do by coupling together two or more reactions so that those reactions oscillate with a fixed period. That's the circadian clock. It has to do with expression of genes that mutually interact with each other, that mutually control each other's expression. We have a really good class on circadian rhythms in plants. Actually, it covers all organisms. It's taught in, I think it's taught in plant breeding. If you're interested in it, it's a it's a really cool class. There's also a, a biology um, freshman seminar on circadian rhythms. Okay. But basically, it's an internal clock that runs on its own cycle that, in the normal day daylight cycle, is entrained to be exactly 24 hours. And it controls lots and lots of different processes. And the reason for that control is to optimize resource allocation in the regular light-dark cycle. And that regular light-dark cycle has been the same since life evolved on Earth. So it's not particularly surprising that that is something that's pretty old. All organisms have it. Your sleep deprivation has in part, is in part caused by screwing up your circadian rhythms. You're not supposed to see light at night. Okay, that's it. We will finish up on Friday. Friday's going to be an interesting, should be an interesting lecture because the stress physiology allows us to bring together, you should be bringing together,
basically everything we've talked about over the course of the semester and applying it to how plants respond to high salt, low water, high temperature, those sorts of things, okay?